Welcome to a brand new episode of Law and Batting Order. I'm your host, Tony Iliacostas. Before I kick off today's episode, I wanted to make a very special introduction for a new addition to the Labo set. To my left, we have a custom bobblehead of me and my dad sporting member of Labo Nation sweatshirts, along with the Labo Justice Scale. As you can see, the bobbleheads mimic a photo of me and my dad sporting the same shirts. The detail is absolutely extraordinary from the smiles to even the hairstyles. The bobbleheads have claimed their rightful spot on the Labo set and the argument can and should be made that the bobbleheads are the official mascot of Wombatting Batting Order. I should extend a very special thank you to my mom for buying this very thoughtful gift and bobbleheads.com for doing an immaculate job designing the bobbleheads. Anyway, thanks for allowing me to kick off today's episode with that, and here are some quick hits from the past two weeks. We're used to turning on our TVs and watching ESPN, regional sports stations, or our local news to get sports news, but now there's a new player in the sports station scene. Last week, the all-new 24-hour sports station Fox Sports 1 debuted. The station features programming including a daily football segment called Fox Football Daily, an entertainment and sports talk show called Crowd Goes Wild, and a sports news show called Fox Sports Live. Fox Sports Live features panelists comprised of former athletes, and the hosts of the program are former TSN anchors Jay Onright and Dan O'Toole. Both anchors are hilarious and add life when watching sports highlights and replays. Overall, I've been watching Fox Sports 1 for the whole week, and I've actually been pretty impressed with the content thus far. Of course, they have a long way to go before they can compete with ESPN. So on the unofficial Labo scale of one bobblehead of me to five bobbleheads, I'm going to give it a solid three and a half bobbleheads. An unusual situation arose last week for former American League MVP Miguel Tejada. Tejada, who had been playing as a utility man for the Kansas City Royals this season, was suspended 105 games under MLB's drug testing policy after testing positive for amphetamines, also known as Adderall. However, Miguel Tejada had been receiving Adderall through a prescription from his doctor and was granted a therapeutic use exemption under MLB's drug testing policy. When Tejada's exemption was expired, he was in the process of renewing it when he continued taking Adderall and tested positive on two different occasions for the substance. It's unfortunate that Tejada's exemption didn't fall through in time for Tejada to avoid a suspension, as this effectively ends Miguel Tejada's career. Two high-profile athletes have been indicted this week for murder. One athlete is former Patriots tight end Aaron Hernandez, who was indicted by a grand jury in Massachusetts for first-degree murder for the death of Odin Lloyd. Aaron Hernandez pled not guilty to the murder charge as well as the weapons charges against him. In that case, the prosecution will have the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that Aaron Hernandez indeed killed Odin Lloyd, and that requires the prosecution to supply the murder weapon that was used to kill Lloyd. Meanwhile, in South Africa, Paralympian Oscar Pistorius was indicted for the murder of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. Prosecutors say that witnesses heard Steenkamp screaming at the time of the murder. Prosecutors also say that Pistorius' actions were premeditated and they plan on calling 100 plus witnesses during the 14-day trial, which is expected to kick off in March of 2014. Keep in mind that in South Africa, there is no jury system, so the decision rests solely in the judge's hands. In both the Pistorius and in Hernandez cases, much detail has yet to be revealed, but my hope is that the truth will be revealed justly and fairly. Today's Order in the Court will dive back into the world of performance-enhancing drugs. On this show, I've talked about performance-enhancing drugs in Major League Baseball and even Lance Armstrong coming clean about using performance-enhancing drugs during his cycling career. And in light of the recent suspensions of 14 Major League Baseball players for their involvement in the biogenesis scandal, Coupled with the NFL tapping into the HGH drug testing world, the sports law world continues to be immersed by this hot topic. But aside from the legality of PED use and enforcement, what do athletes think of this? To help us understand what goes through the mind of an athlete when thinking about performance enhancing drugs, it is my privilege and my honor to introduce U.S. Olympian and track star D.D. Trotter, who won the gold medal in the 2004 Summer Olympics in Athens in the 4x400 meter relay race. Uh, missed the 2008 Summer Olympics because of a brutal knee injury, but came back better than ever in London in 2012, uh, took home the bronze in the 400-meter race, and won gold in the 4x400-meter relay. Uh, she also has an organization raising awareness of PED use called Test Me I'm Clean, which we'll dive into uh, throughout the conversation. Didi, welcome to Law and Batting Order. How's it going? 
I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. And my pleasure. So let's start off with the question that I'm sure a lot of Olympic fans uh, want to ask or are curious to know, which is your experience in 2012 in London. How rewarding of an experience was that? And, you know, the opportunity of coming back from that brutal knee injury that kept you out in Beijing in 2008. How did it feel taking home bronze in the uh, 400 meter race and gold in the four by 400 meter relay? Uh, it was very exciting, but to make a slight correction, I was actually on the 2008 team. Um, I made that team with the injury, which okay. um, didn't allow me to make the finals. However, that was kind of what fueled that that energy I needed to try to get to that Olympic podium in 2012. And being so close in Beijing and not being able to grasp that victory is, you know, definitely enough to start to motivate you. So um, in London, to have that um, after the surgery and have three years of kind of struggling, it was the most rewarding experience ever, of course, to go all the way to London and to uh, get there and, and be able to have the individual medal um, achieved after, you know, uh, almost 10 years of a career. And um, to cap that off with a gold medal in the 4x4 was just one of the most exciting events I've ever had the opportunity of um, being involved in as an Olympic athlete. Um, of course, it is the highlight of my career. So none, needless to say, it was a great experience. That's awesome. And congratulations to you again on that massive achievement. Now, a friend of mine on Facebook uh, wanted me to ask you this, insisted that I ask you about this, America Ninja Warrior. How was that experience? <laughs> okay, so being a Ninja Warrior has probably turned out to be one of the coolest things I've ever <laughs> done. Um, besides being Olympic track star, I think Ninja Warrior somehow is Ranking up there <laughs> when it comes to uh, how popular the topic is. Um, it was amazing. It's um, exhilarating and um, a totally different way than I'm used to um, having that type of adrenaline. And uh, to be able to go out there and uh, compete in a different way and, you know, show off a little bit of my ninja skills, you know, I think uh, it's definitely something that everyone, if you get a chance and you like that kind of stuff, totally try it. But um, I'm looking forward to doing the next season again. I hope I get another shot. Definitely. Now, my ninja skills aren't that good. This is as good of a ninja I can get, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it works anyway. But um, what, what does the future hold in store for you in your career? Will we expect to see you in Rio in 2016? Yeah, absolutely. Um I was just telling another interviewer the other day that um, I plan to make 2016 like uh, I'm hoping to make that my career's greatest work. So I'm looking to make it my Picasso. And um, I am just really excited about um, getting out there and going for it one more time. I definitely have goals of making the 2016 team. And, you know, um, I think uh, currently maybe people don't understand that, you know, I kind of took the year with a different approach this season. I, you know, stepped away from the 400 a little bit and ran the 200 more. And that's just to give my body time to recover and be able to come back to do what I do best, you know. So um, I am definitely, no doubt about it, going for Rio 2016. Awesome, man. I'm sure uh, Lawn Batting Order supporters will be behind you full-fledged, full no doubt about it. We'll be supporting you in Rio. Um, so let's dive into your organization and I should give some backstory to uh, viewers out there on how I actually came across Dee Dee. In addition to following her Olympic career, of course, uh, I did. She, out of the blue, tweeted at me, actually from her organization, Test Me I'm Clean. And I actually didn't know that you were such a vocal supporter of, against performance enhancing drugs. And, you know, you'll occasionally see an athlete really being in support of cleaning up their respective sport. But not like you, you're actually very unique. You've probably been one of the most outspoken athletes. And I think. In my, at least in my opinion, that's a good thing because it really encourages young athletes going forward to really uh, be smart about how they take care of their body, at least from a professional uh, perspective. And, in, you know, when they compete in athletics, it just promotes integrity. But let's discuss your campaign. Uh, that's how I came across uh, your organization, Test Me, I'm Clean. Can you just tell the audience a little bit about how you started the organization and more importantly, why you started it? Well, um, I started Test Me I'm Clean in 2007, and it really um, came out of some personal aggression that I had about uh, the sport and what I saw happening in track and field. Um, the Balco scandal was something that um, really affected the perception of how uh, the public saw track and field athletes, and, it, and we started to be kind of 
uh, put under the same shadow of negativity that was, you know, trickling from this event with the Balco scandal. So I personally took offense to that and said, you know, I heard this guy on an airplane, he was reading the newspaper and uh, he basically had it open to the sports page and he said, they all do it. You know, and I, I turned around and I said, excuse me? <laughs> no, 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 we don't all do it. I'm an Olympic gold medalist. I don't do any of that and I've never even considered it. So, you know, to say that, you've, you've offended me, you know, and at that point I said, I need to do something for myself that allows me to, you know, basically um, separate myself from any of that negativity. And it became, it was really just about me taking a stand for myself, you know, and once I um, started doing the research, you know, the first thing I said, I was like, you can test me any day of the week. You guys, you sign up and hook up their, their, their whole clinic right up to my house. <laughs> and we're good every day of the week. I know that 365, you know? So, and I, I would always say I'm 100% pure athlete, nothing else. And I decided that that sounded like uh, a motto. I decided that it sounded like a cause. I decided that I would try to allow other athletes to do exactly what I'm doing that have that same mentality and, you know, speak out against it, speak up for themselves as well. Um, in the process of trying to start testing me, I'm clean. I started doing some research and I stumbled on a lot of research that showed high school kids and middle school girls and just this alarming number of young future uh, athletes and college athletes and professional, you know, these are our future stars, um, were using steroids. And you got to be kidding me. You know, and there was all type of reasons for why, you know, um, trying to get scholarships, trying to fit in, physical issues. You know, I said, this is terrible. They're not understanding and they're not getting the education that will let them know that this is not some recreational um, drug that has no side effects and that there's nothing negative that can come of this. That's not the case. And they need to know that there's dangers associated with doing these type of things. And your health is, you know, being in danger by doing such, even your future, you know, the future of your children and things like that. So I just decided that this was bigger than me. And that's when I turned Test Me, I'm Clean into a educational program. And it's a motivational program. And it's basically designed to educate, inspire, and motivate these young future stars at, of all ages. You know, it's not just um, college or professional. It's from, if you get them young, <laughs> that integrity will be ingrained in them. And then they'll be able to, you know, carry that with them. And they're least likely to ever go down a road like that, no matter where any pressure or anything might come from. Right. So um, that's kind of how we got to where we are. And um, we put the wristbands out and that allows people that are, you know, 100 percent standing up for themselves. Now we have a visible mark that says, oh, wrong arm, visible mark that says, um, you know, who you are and what you stand for. So. Uh, it's been a great journey so far. Sports Illustrated featured our wristbands the very first year. So awesome. it was really exciting. Yeah, that's great. And and keep up the great work. I'm sure the education really is important. And, you know, it's funny because it's that that's really where it all begins. It's all about educating. And that's the case with a lot of other things. You've seen it in the concussion world. People didn't right. know what concussions were until people were educated on the topic. And you right. see the same thing here with PEDs. Now, my next question may sound rhetorical, but I think it's important to ask it anyway. Yeah. As an Olympian, why why is there such a stigma against performance-enhancing drugs? I think that, you know, you have one bad apple, two bad apples, three bad apples. It starts to become, you know, what um, everything becomes questionable. You know, it's like no performance goes unquestioned at this point. You can't have a successful win without every, you know, some people turning an eye to it or, ah, maybe this, maybe that. There's been so much negativity. Um, it's just, it's almost been impossible to shake it. And um, I think we're getting to the point now where it's almost becoming the acceptable norm, which I think is unacceptable. You know, I think now the, I think I've heard now that, it's helping to level the playing field, which is me quoting some things that I've heard. And I just don't agree with that. It's, it's absolutely doing the opposite of that. And um, I, I don't know what it's, what we're going to be able to do or get ahead of it. But all I know that I can do is offer people that are being honest, um, that are uh, continuing to use only their hard work, their honesty and their honor and their integrity that's intact to allow them to voice their opinion and be a, be vocal about who they are and 
let the world know that they've separated themselves from the stigma. Uh, it is just unfortunate that it's come to that where, you know, you sit down and every good result has a question mark behind it, you know? Absolutely. I don't know how we got here. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. That's exactly right. I totally agree with you there. Now, as an athlete who has competed on a large stage numerous times, how rampant is PED use? And can you share, if possible, your experience around someone who used performance-enhancing drugs? Um, I have been able to always make decisions that have not ever put me in to close relationship um, training-wise with people that have been involved in using PEDs. I choose the company that I keep very carefully. And um, I've always been with, um, you know, a coach that has a very good reputation, a program that has a very good reputation. And I try to always keep that um, as a priority because sometimes you are, if you put yourself into a situation where you're going into a camp where they're infamously known for having drug athletes or there, you know, there's these um, uh, case by case situations dealing with specific coaches and specific training groups and training locations then you have to know before you make that decision that you're putting yourself at risk for being associated with these things. And even if you have never done anything, association sometimes becomes what people see of you. So it's, you know, it's just very careful who you have to be careful who you surround yourself with. Um, I personally haven't had that experience to have that one-on-one -on -one closeness. I have been friends with people um, that I've gone to school with and have past relationship with who I'm very close to on the friend level who've gone through these circumstances of being banned and, um, having, um, having, uh, been ex accused and convicted of using steroids or PEDs and, um, have served their sentences and are back in the sport now, you know, and there's just a lot of mixed emotions from me when it relates to knowing somebody before that happens. You know, you want to say, I'm sorry for what you're going through, but at the same time, you got to say, why would you do that? You know, and why would you compromise yourself and your integrity and the sport? You know, it's, I hate that sometimes it's forgotten that one person's actions can have a domino effect on the sport. It has a domino effect on the individuals who compete with you. If you take first, someone got fourth. If that person doesn't get, if you come up positive for a test, then the fourth place person never got their medal on the podium. They never got to be a part of the flag victory run. They never got to take any pictures and photos. That whole memory for them doesn't exist. And to send them their medal in the mail is completely unacceptable. And it doesn't even do it justice, even remotely. So I definitely am glad that I haven't had that personal experience to touch, to be in touch with someone who's been that, um, who's been that close to me in my training proximity to know that they were doing something. Cause I would definitely not tolerate that. I would either remove myself or make sure that that situation was removed. I just can't. Right. Right. So, um, diving into back into the broad world of PEDs. Um, you know, we, it's, as I said, it's been possibly one of the biggest topics in the sports law discussion and especially as of late with what happened with major league baseball and biogenesis huge scandal going yeah. on there and the question in that situation has been whether or not major league baseball's drug testing program is effective and in your case you've dealt with two basically huge drug enforcement governing bodies usada and i would assume wada right. um, but you know having had the experience going through the the whole system with drug testing under USADA and WADA, how effective are WADA and USADA in enforcing uh, drug testing? And do you have any criticisms in the way that they perform drug tests? Yeah, as, you know, absolutely. I I definitely think that WADA and um, I can speak more closely to uh, the the workings of USADA. Right. Um, USADA and I have had a relationship working um, to combat against steroids in in sports for years. I've been a part of their My Victory program. They have been a huge supporter of Test Me, I'm Clean. And together, you know, we have been um, on a mission to try to see what we can do from picking the athlete's brain to working right with the organization on what we can all do better. And um, the protocols that are put into place right now, they are not flawless. However, they are a variation of something that can be effective long term. Um, I think that what we're doing at this point at USADA is um, trying to do the best that we can with what we know about. But a lot of times 
the general public and a lot of people that just follow sports don't understand we when they say, well, if they're testing them, how they're not, why are they not getting caught? You know, and it's because a lot of times they're testing for what they only know exists. If they, they can't test for everything, it's impossible. There's even budgets. I've been to, uh, to on Capitol Hill trying to make sure that they didn't cut the budget for drug <laughs> testing, literally. So um, I think that there has, um, uh, there's a disconnect between what people actually understand we are capable of doing and drug testing. Um, there are some limitations. Like, as, like I said, we can't test for what we don't know exists. And there's new synthetic drugs being um, mastered up right now as we speak, I'm sure, in some lab. And there's nothing we can do to test for that until we know to test for it. So they're doing everything they can. And um, I think once they uh, get the results that that when they do come up with positive results and they do smack down on some of these, you know, um, drug cheats, they are then taking action. A lot of time, my personal opinion, I think that the actions are a little too light handed, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's athletes that are dealing with major drugs and I don't think their bands are, are heavy enough. You know, I personally don't. I've always believed in zero tolerance because I don't think you should have another shot to come back. I think you've stolen enough people's victory and stolen enough people's money and stolen enough people's fame. And, you know, I think you've stolen enough. I don't think you deserve the right to come back and, and participate, me personally. Um, and I understand that every circumstance is not the same. I understand that that does not apply across the board, so I'm not nailing everyone to the coffin. But I definitely think in some cases there needs to be a a tougher sentence so that the that you're, you are respecting the people that did do it with integrity. It's not right for me to have to, you know, continue to live my second or third place life. And then you got to reap the benefits of all the money from winning. And here I am just being regular old me. Mm -hmm. I definitely think there's more we can do on the ban side of things. And I definitely think that there's more we can do when it comes to testing. Um, there's one flaw in the system that I have personally spoke with um, some of the reps at USADA about. And I don't think that they understand what the deterrence level has dropped to when they notify athletes that they're no longer in the testing pool. Um, in track and field, if you drop to a certain level in ranking, that um, basically meaning if you were in the top 10 or top 20 or there's a certain number you could drop to if your performance starts to decline, where they'll tell you by letter, you don't need to, you know, send any more, uh, any more uh, reports into where your whereabouts will be, no longer required to fill out a whereabouts. And they'll tell you that. Now, see, I think that's completely insane. The only thing keeping those people that are now dropping from the top to the bottom to where they don't no longer have to be in the training, the testing pool. Now, those are the perfect people that will likely turn to something else in order to get back to the top. Their probability of going to something that's not allowed is more likely because now they have lost maybe their contracts, their money, their um, training camps, their ability to afford food, apartment, cars. They are looking for a way to get back in. And desperation is what causes a lot of this sometimes, where there's desperation from injury, desperation of money. There's these things that will trigger you to maybe look for a secondary route, one that you may have not necessarily considered before. So when you tell them that you're not going to test them, they don't have anything to worry about. You just remove the only deterrent factor that they have. So I definitely am struggling with that rule. I don't like that. Don't send them a letter. If you're not going to test them, they should have the fear of God behind them thinking that any time they could come knocking on that door and that you need to get your life together in order to, you know, like I got to stay straight, you know? So I think that that's a huge, huge mistake to do that. Um, if nothing else, let them send in their whereabouts and put it in a file that nobody looks in. I don't care what you do with it, but I don't think telling them not to fill out a whereabouts is a good idea. I think you should be under the eye of speculation until you retire from the sport. That's a really, I mean, that's a great tip. And hopefully, you know, you know, our hope is that USADA really takes that into consideration. Yeah, but... I've, I've been talking to them about it. So, <laughs> Well, they should have you like as probably like the next president of USADA. That's, <laughs> if, if I need to be the campaign manager, be I'll make that happen. <laughs> uh, He's going to groom me for it. Yeah, though. exactly. <laughs> um, so given your very emphatic uh, notions and uh, view on drug testing and the enforcement of it, 
comparing that to what NF, what the NFL and MLB are going through right now. This week, NFL was speculating on testing retired players, using them basically as guinea pigs for HGH testing. And now Major League Baseball, I would not be surprised if next season or the season after, they basically tear up the current drug testing policy and create a new one after what just happened and unfolded with Biogenesis. Given what those two leagues in particular have been enduring, um, w- what do you think has to be the objective of each league going forward uh, for drug testing procedures to be successful in their fronts? I, you know, just from the outside, I'm not on the inside of baseball nor football. I do have friends in sp- in, in both sports, but I, I definitely, from an outside perspective, feel like their drug testing policies and in uh, regulation is a lot looser. <laughs> than what we deal with in track and field. I mean, I just, I don't feel like the standard of what they are looking for and how they look for it is high enough. Um, I could be completely wrong. It's just from my perspective on the outside. Um, I definitely think they need to real, really, really put a protocol into place and really abide by it. I know there's a lot of money involved in the sport and it seems like they're willing to chop off a track and field person's head in a heartbeat. We make nearly nothing close to what they make. You know, they'll give them, you know, a $50,000 fine and tell them to go on their way. I just, you know, there are really no repercussions for their actions. It, it doesn't seem as though there's a real repercussion for their actions. You know, with the, the 50 game ban that we just recently had, that's been the toughest that has ever been given out. And to me, that is a, again, a slap on the wrist for a multimillionaire player. You know, this, this to me is, um, if there were harsher consequences, I think you see less of the foolishness, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I think the rule is so, I think the rules and the protocols are so janky, forgive my lightness of the word, but it's so, they're so janky that nobody, it's like, oh, uh, if I get called, okay, I just have to give up $25,000, $50,000. Okay, that's a pair of shoes, you know? So I just think that there's no fear, really. When you have that much money and the consequences is to pay some, or to miss a few games. I know seriously missing a few games is a big deal for a professional player, but it's not the end of your career. It's a few games. Right. You're willing to t- maybe you're willing to take the risk, you know, it's not oh if I don't if I take these drugs and I get caught, they will fire me. You know, there is a difference between that mentality and the mentality of I can hit a few home runs before they catch up with me or I can score a couple more touchdowns before I get caught. You know, and then if I do get caught, oh, I got to sit out a couple games. But my stats still say I scored those touchdowns and hit those home runs. You know, so I think like I, like I think the point is that if they don't really seriously implement a program that is designed to really actually give people some type of consequence for their actions, you will see these continue to happen with just the game suspensions and the money and the little this and that, little that. And then people will continue to go on their way and we'll lose a hero every day, you know? So I I just think, you know, I think to be honest, they don't really take it um, seriously enough on the level of the actions that they're, um, or the repercussions that actually equate to the actions of the players. And if they don't really start doing that, they're not, they're not going to get much of a change there. And what's interesting is that, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because you're speaking from a very different perspective. Your sport, aside from having competitions, you know, every so often within the year, you're where you really, really come out is, you know, really on in the Olympic stage. And even then, your your drug testing uh, procedures are very strict. For Major League Baseball, you for at least when I first studied the drug testing policy, you know, 50 games seemed reasonable. But when we started hearing about A Rod getting t- 211 game suspension, and now he's appealing that. That really created a new perspective in terms of whether or not the drug testing procedure should be more strict, something as strict as a 200-game suspension. But wow. obviously, time will tell in that type of mm-hmm. situation. Um, so to wrap everything up, I do want to touch back on your uh, campaign, your organization, Test Me, I'm Clean. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish in the future as you move forward with the Test Me, I'm Clean organization and the campaign? Well, I guess you in the, the larger scheme of things, my ultimate goal is to be a program that is um, mildly yet strongly implicated in, in the school's regular drug awareness um, segment of their education. 
um, you know, no more different than when we start talking about D.A.R.E. and when we start talking about um, uh, Red Ribbon Week and these programs that are designed to help kids stay away at a young age, notify them, let them know the dangers of street drugs. I think steroids needs to start as, as I think it's obviously becoming clear that this is a drug that is clearly going under the radar here. And I think that if we can put this same concept right next to this stay off a of crack, stay off a of cocaine, stay off a of heroin, stop huffing paint, that same concept needs to be right next door to steroids and PEDs. I think we need to make them aware from the little kids that we tell not to use those street drugs, they need to know just as much as uh, just as much about these drugs as they do about those, because these ones are the secret little killers. These ones won't tell you that they'll mess up your chances to have kids. These ones won't tell you that you know they'll they can cause uh, disease and illness in your body and, and and cardiac arrest. These things they don't tell you that when they start talking about steroids. Steroids looks pretty, you know, the muscles and the fame and the baseball players and the football players and the track stars. Steroids has a different face. So I think that you know a crack a cokehead doesn't really have a good look. <laughs> so I think you can say that you know for. For steroids, the, it's very polished. And if we don't start showing these kids what it really looks like, they won't know. My ultimate goal is to educate from a young program and get it implemented into the schools. That's ultimately what we want to do. But more so than anything, just on a day-to-day -day basis, we want to reach someone, let them know that they can stand up for themselves, even if it's one person at a time. Put your wristband on. Say, test me, I'm clean. Anytime you run a race, say, test me, I'm clean. Just give yourself the space to not be associated with the dark cloud. And the more of us that will stand up, the more of us it'll be against those who are not doing things with integrity. So that's great. And again, I can't begin to commend you on how, how outspoken you are about this very, very passionate topic. And it's great to see an athlete really take a stand, be proactive rather than just sit behind the sidelines, say it's bad, and then just carry on with their life. Very, very admirable, Dee Dee. If you want to follow uh, Dee Dee Trotter, I'll have all her information down below in the description box, including her Twitter and also her organization's website, Test Me I'm Clean, and the Twitter handle for that. Dee Dee, thank you so much for being the very first uh, athlete to be on Law and Batting Order. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thanks, Anthony. That's the show. Leave all your comments down below, and be sure to visit Law and Batting Order at lawandbattingorder.com as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Take care, guys.